So we will not have a panel discussion after the presentations, but go immediately to your questions. Um, so be ready um, to have your questions. So I want to allow my, I'm Debbie Burks, I want the, my fabulous co-chair to introduce herself. Hello, good morning. My name is Indira Itmagambetova. I am working as associate director of CDC. Unfortunately, our deputy minister from Kazakhstan couldn't make it due to some busy schedules. That's why I am co-chairing this session. Terrific. And so in light of being four minutes early to, by decreasing our introduction time, we'll add that to the question time, not to your presentation time. Um, so our first presentation is by Carolina Moli. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Carolyn Amel. I'm with the Clinton Health Access Initiative. And today I'm going to talk to give a sort of update with where we are today with access to medicines for those living with HIV. I'm also going to speak briefly with where we are um, with access to medicines for those at risk of HIV. I have no conflicts. Um, so we have made really remarkable progress in scaling access to antiretroviral therapy. The number of people living with HIV on treatment today in low- and middle-income countries has nearly tripled since 2010, in large part uh, due to the efforts of big donors like PEPFAR, Global Fund, and others. At the same time, we've also seen the price of treatment dramatically lowered, uh, thereby helping to enable that scale up you just saw in the previous slide. Um, in September of last year, Chai, together with a number of other partners, announced a breakthrough pricing deal on the fixed dose combination of tenofovir, lamivudine, and dolutegravir, known as TLD. Um, this pricing deal represented the first time that we've introduced a new product, um, a new highly optimal regimen at or below the standard of care uh, price. And the reason that's really a transformational thing is that every other time, as you can see in this chart on the left, that we've introduced a new and improved regimen, we've, we've forced ministries of health to, to make a choice. Do you want to pay more? Um, and give your patients a, a better drug, or do you want to save money and scale up, um, but have your patients on a suboptimal regimen? Um, with this deal, we eliminated that choice from ministries of health, um, and we hope that we're putting in place a virtuous cycle whereby the next time a new optimal regimen is introduced, um, we will see the same thing where it must be introduced at or below the price of the current standard of care. Uh, the picture is not all sunny, though. Uh, despite that global progress, significant disparities remain across geographies um, and populations towards the 90-90-90 goals. Um, geographically, those areas um, with generalized uh, burdens um, and high donor support, particularly in Eastern and Southern Africa, have seen a significant decline in the rate of new infections. Um, while simultaneously, you see a, a spike in the rate of new infections in places like Eastern Europe. Um, as we've heard articulated a lot this week, um, there are, are adolescents and young people, both, both young women and young men, uh, are at a disproportionate risk of HIV infection, um, as are key populations. So these are all groups and geographies where we need to, to keep the focus. And turning now to children, uh, scale-up in children continues to lag behind adults, and the job is far from done. So we have made progress. Um, we've more than doubled the number of, of children on treatment. We've halved the number of new infections. And due to efforts of the global pediatric community, like the IATT formulary, the ARV procurement working group, uh, many other sort of alphabet soup acronyms, um, we have been able to streamline um, new product introduction and, and optimize uh, the products that are available to a degree. Uh, however, the job is far from done. Pediatric coverage rates continue to lag behind adults, um, and better drugs are still not available for children. Um, although we've made a lot of progress, I think, in making better drugs avail available for kids, the regimens available to them continue to be inferior to those that are available to adults. 
Um, and this leads uh, to low levels of viral load suppression, which we see among children. Um, so part of the challenge that we're faced with then um, is a much harder to reach group of infants and children. Um, so the majority of the new pediatric infections are, are coming from uh, women who are either not accessing ANC services at all, um, women who stero converted after initially testing negative in ANC, or women who just drop off um, and out of PMTCT programs. None of those groups are, are going to be easy to, to reach. Um, and then on, uh, for those children who have been infected, um, children are still being missed in high volume settings like OPD. The work is not done on the inpatient side and, and scaling innovations like point of care EID. Um, and we're also not finding some of the well children who are living longer than we originally uh, thought they might be able to. And then of course the challenges with adolescents. Um, so all of this is to say uh, we have a, a challenging situation um, and we'll need to employ an, a, a really sort of optimized mix of, of strategies to find uh, the women as well as the children. Um, and then I, I also just wanted to highlight, it might be a little hard to see, I think one of the lines has totally disappeared, but the, the black line with the X's is West and Central Africa, the darker blue bar is East and Southern Africa, the lighter blue bar that you can see is, is global. Um, and, and so you can see a significant disparity in coverage rates for kids in West and Central Africa, as well as a sort of failure to see a decline in the rate of, of new infections in that region. Uh, so, we, so we need to increase focus there. Um, and in the pediatric market, which is uh, less price sensitive for sure, I think, than the adult market, um, there are still a lot of challenges, as I mentioned, around optimization of regimens and formulations. Um, a, a number of efforts have been, been made, as I indicated earlier, to kind of accelerate access to the best products, um, but we're, we're still not uh, doing enough for children. Uh, when we do have improve products and introduce them. Sometimes they face supply challenges or supply and demand disconnect. So um, what is required to push through these barriers um, is coordinated engagement on both the supply and demand sides of the market. And that sounds really obvious, but um, sometimes we see efforts that are made on one side of the market and not the other. So for example, uh, a, a, an organization negotiates a deal for a, a product, they get a great price for it, there is zero demand, has been zero communication in country, and therefore there is zero uptake. Um, so that is completely ineffective, no one cares at all that you got a good price. On the other hand, um, sometimes, although it can also be strategic, it can be risky um, to build a lot of demand for a product that you don't know is actually going to exist, um, or when it will exist, and uh, at what capacity for that supplier. So all of that is to say you need to simultaneously engage on both sides of the market. Um, there are a number of mechanisms that can be uh, deployed, um, both on the supply and demand side. I will say that some of these mechanisms are, are highly innovative, and others are, are kind of tried and true, things that we know we need to be doing but are not necessarily doing. So I think we need to do both kind of the, the sexy mechanisms, the incentives, um, the, the catalytic procurement, and we also need to do the things that are less sexy that we, we know we need to do to accelerate access. So just some examples um, at catalytic procurement. Uh, often when a new product becomes available, you see a bit of a chicken and egg situation where the supplier needs a first order so that they can begin kind of scaling their capacity. Um, you also see countries kind of wanting to get some initial experience with a, a brand new product before they scale access, and so it's this, this really frustrating disconnect. Um, but by placing an initial order, even just some small purchase orders for a few countries, you can then have the supplier kick off their manufacturing and also build that experience, that early adopter experience, in a small set of countries. Um, of course, the end-to-end -end planning, the partnerships with and advocacy by, and I would say leadership from civil society has been, has been huge um, in this space, and I think you'll hear Polly talk more about that later. Um, accelerated registration, perhaps through uh, mechanisms like the CRP. 
On the supply side, those are demand side mechanisms that also touch and overlap with the supply side. On the supply side, there are pricing agreements and volume guarantees, uh, including sort of in, in that category what I spoke to earlier. Um, I, I think another mechanism that can be really effective are public-private partnerships between an NGO and innovator and generic uh, suppliers um, to accelerate tech transfer. Um, financial incentives, we are, are partnering with Unitaid um, on, on a project, which I'll mention in a minute, to um, accelerate access to products by providing a financial incentive in a highly competitive uh, process. And then, of course, coordinated monitoring of supply. Um, so I wanted to just walk through an example. If we take Dolly Tegrevier, how did we how did we deploy some of those mechanisms I just I just discussed? So with a catalytic procurement through our Unitate Optimal ARV project, um, we were able to uh, after the the first generic Dolly Tegrevier single product became available, we were able to place some initial orders for Kenya, Nigeria, and Uganda bring the product into country, and then do what we refer to as effectively enhanced implementation monitoring in those countries uh, to be sure that we were um, able to kind of understand what was going on with rollout and uh, take those results and apply them. I already discussed the pricing agreement. Um, partnerships with civil society, AfroCab, um, as well as uh, an optimal ARV community advisory board, um, Polly Clayton and iBase have been uh, a kind of a huge part of our work, have been really critical, I think, both on the, the treatment literacy side and then as issues have come up, because they do and will come up with every time we introduce a new product, um, whether that's a supply concern, a potential safety signal, I think um, having that kind of existing treatment literacy in the community um, and the, the leadership from the community um, to kind of drive the dialogue and be included in decision making has been, has been huge. Um, and then the other two I've spoken of. Access to Dolly Take River for children lags behind um, access for adults. Um, however, there are a few innovative efforts underway to accelerate generic availability. Um, the first, I think if Martina were in the audience, I'm not sure she would be thrilled with me calling this an innovative effort or mechanism, but um, I actually found the WHO uh, pediatric guidelines to be quite innovative in some ways um, by including pediatric dolutegravir all the way down um, to sort of above four weeks. Um, while we still are kind of gathering information on, on, on dosing um, and don't yet have the product available. I think it's an, a very powerful signal both to suppliers and to countries that this is the way of the future and let's move as fast as we can. Um, and that, that progressive global guidance can hopefully convert to rapid country guidance. Um, we also have a product development incentive through our Unitate grant. Um, this was a partnership that we announced last week with Unitaid, Chai, and Vive, who's the innovator supplier. Um, the, Vive's part in this is, is to partner with us and provide, um, uh, to do the tech transfer with the generics. Um, and we also are providing through our Unitaid grant an incentive um, to the two generic companies that uh, uh, won the incentive. There are also a no number of other mechanisms that we will consider um, rolling out as well. Um, so I wanted to just very quickly uh, to talk about uh, prevention because I think there are some, some similarities and some things that are not similar. Um, we've seen huge progress as, as we just reviewed in, in treatment scale up. Uh, the annual number of new infections we know has flatlined at 1.8 million. So we know we need accelerated prevention efforts. Oral prep is the first ARV based prevention tool that we have available. Um, and is being introduced by national programs. Um, as you can see with that red dot, the number of estimated active uh, users on PrEP today, are it's around 200,000. Worth noting that the majority, uh, maybe vast majority of those actually, the, the new initiations are, are in the United States still. Um, so we've seen a lot of momentum in a number of countries within Sub-Saharan Africa around PrEP introduction. Um, and I think we've sort of addressed some of the barriers, but a lot more needs to be done to understand uptake and continued use. 
Those are themes that you've heard a, a lot for those of you kind of on the prevention track at this conference um, that have come up a lot. I think on the drug availability and pricing side, which as you've just heard me discuss, those are a lot of kind of the things we address on the treatment side. It's been different with PrEP because the, the product was already available in supply chains and approved for treatment. So it meant that some of the barriers that exist otherwise for this product um, were a lot kind of easier to resolve or non-existent. Um, and a number of countries have now in place an enabling policy environment. Um, where, we, where we need to focus is what I've highlighted in yellow, um, which is just as we know, um, uptake of PrEP has been slow. Um, the this, this sort of drop-off rates or um, lack of continued use is um, perhaps concerning. Um, and we need to know kind of how we can best target uh, and reach adolescent girls and young women. Um, and then just lastly, I would say that uh, in, it, it can become frustrating to sort of uh, learn the same lessons again and kind of ask the same questions and answers again um, every time you introduce a new product. And so through the Prevention Market Manager um, and, and through the efforts of many different partners in the prevention space, um, we are working to start really early um, to uh, form a strategy to accelerate, um, uh, if and when it becomes FDA approved, to accelerate access to the long-acting cabotegravir injectable, and then likely other products in the future, perhaps an implant as well, so that we are not starting at the point of FDA approval and being years behind in access to, access to those who need the product, um, but rather we've got everything set up so that we can go as quickly as the product is available. Um, and then lastly, just like to thank our donors. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I will, we will move to our next presentation presented by Dr. Aganam. Hopefully I got that closer to right. <laughs> Okay, um, I am the Deputy Director of the United Nations uh, University Institu um, Research Institute for Global Health, based in Malaysia. Um, our mandate is to serve as the think tank for the UN system, uh, to be critical when the UN, um, any of the UN agencies, in our own case, because um, we are a health research institute, uh, looking at WHO, UNLs, and the, um, the other UN agencies and programs with a, a mandate on health. So when, um, um, as a think tanker, we um, are supposed to uh, critically appraise their programs and to uh, provide solutions on how they could do things the right way. So we're very much um, an academic um, arm of the United Nations system. I, I was asked to, to talk about South-South cooperation and um, some of the flexibilities in the TRIPS agreement. TRIPS stands for related aspects of intellectual property rights. This is one of the agreements that was um, um, negotiated by the uh, World Trade Organization member states that came into force in 1995, um, which has had a lot of impact on um, patents for pharmaceuticals, including access to antiretroviral drugs. So I would uh, like to um, step a bit back in history to, um, I know that you know, so this, you know, the Global South is something that uh, we talk about, but most times we have different views and different conceptions of what constitutes the South. Um, so if we step back a bit in the 60s and 70s, uh, there was um, a group of countries within the United Nations, um, uh, which broadly it was a coalition that was known as the G77. So that's where it all started, you know, that uh, activism that was led by China at that time, uh, including uh, all the developing countries from Africa and Latin America um, and the Caribbean, um, basically looking at the international system, how they, what they, call, they, they saw as structural inequalities, you know, um, where um, uh, impediments to their socioeconomic development. So that's where, you know, the, um, so since then, the, uh, the term Global South has undergone a lot of um, 
um, historical metamorphosis. And nobody talks, nobody says or argues that you know the South is homogeneous. You know, there's a lot of heterogeneity, as some of um, you know, some of the scholars argue. Uh, there's a North within the South, and there's a South within the North. So it's not nobody's talking about homogeneity here. But uh, there are things that actually unite these countries um, to the extent that um, the, these alliances have actually been um, have been sustained. You know, from the 60s to the present day. Um, so there's no um, there's unity in diversity, despite these historical differences, the economic differences, the levels of socioeconomic progress within the South. Um, there's still a sense in which we use that those terms, the, the South and the and the um, and the third world interchangeably. Um, and instead of actually uh, emphasizing the things that actually the differences between these countries, we should, uh, as one Indian scholar, B.S. Chimney, argued, we should look at the factors that continue, have continued to bind and to unite them um, from the 50s to 60s to the present day. And it's in the context of that that we have to look at uh, international trade agreements and negotiations um, uh, that brought in the, uh, the World Trade Organization in 1995. Um, so where you have an asymmetrical international system where countries, because of their differential uh, capabilities, whether it's uh, in terms of economic might or the size of their economies, you bring them to the table to negotiate you know, trade agreements, there's bound to be uh, inequities, imbalances in the system. Um, so if you look at what happened you know, in terms of um, um, the transformation of the international trading architecture from 1947 to 2005, uh, you find that... Um, the establishment of the World Trade Organization, the WTO, uh, with those set of agreements, including the TRIPS, which is the one that, that focuses on patents and other intellectual property rights, um, created what was called a single undertaking. So the moment you decide to join that organization, you, are, you don't have any option to, to, you don't have any leeway to, to opt out. You are bound by those, you know, um, annexed 15 agreements. And um, what this has done is uh, it has created a situation where the policy making space within countries is now constrained you know because of you know what happens in in geneva for instance that the wto the um, the trade the dispute uh, understanding so these are some of those agreements I, i'm just rushing through this because um, we've been told that there's a very important speaker after this session and i would want to de to uh, to uh, to delay you um from listening to him um so these are the agreements you know, and if you look at all of this the one that actually relates to what we're talking about today is the TRIPS agreement, the trade related aspects of intellectual property rights. Um, these agreements um, are what makes the WTO um, a very, if, quote unquote, effective organization is the fact that any violation of any of these agreements has um, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a sanction, there's an implication for that. So there's um, the, the one highlighted in red, the so-called uh, dispute settlement understanding, where even if a country has violated the TRIPS agreement, another country can actually take it to, you know, to, uh, to a panel uh, arbitration in Geneva under the WTO. So um, in the 1995 and the years that followed after the WTO came into force, uh, after the TRIPS agreement came into force, a uh, country started realizing the fact that we now have a lot of tensions between the basic human right to life you know, and right to health versus, you know, uh, profit and, you know, over patented products by uh, pharmaceutical comp corporations. So human rights versus IP rights. Civil societies, um, you know, organizations like um, 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 Medicines on Frontier, for instance, Treatment Action Campaign, there are quite a, couple, a good number of them, um, pitched themselves against the, the big pharma, the, the pharmaceutical transnational corporations. Um, this activism um, surrounded you know, um, surrounding the TRIPS agreement, um, um, pitched these, you know, the developing countries supported by the global civil society organizations against the big transnational corporations, principally because if you remember the WTO, um, if, say, for instance, to give the, common, the commonest example, I mean, you know, if, as in Pfizer, for instance, makes a product in the U.S. Uh, and gets it patented, uh, it can take that same product to Cambodia or to Nigeria or to South Africa and say, we want a patent. And if they do that, the minimum you can give them is 20 years patent protection. So you can, you can understand what we're talking about, you know. Um, even though uh, there was a grace period given to these uh, developing countries. But, um, 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 so, but that's, that's what it is, you know, that a, 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 patent, that a product is patented anywhere in the world enjoys, 
you know, uh, global uh, patent protection for at least 20 years. Once these two countries are members of the WTO and they've you know, accepted the TRIPS agreement. Um, so the life versus profit tensions um, um, basically, you know, pitched the global civil society groups against uh, the transnational pharmaceutical companies. Um, and in the, in the early, um, around 2000, um, 2001, 2003, uh, HIV AIDS was declared a global emergency by the, the World Health Organization. And this raised a lot of you know, um, moral and ethical questions about access to treatment. Um, how come we have millions of people um, concentrated in certain regions of the world who are also you know, human beings seeking treatment to extend their lives, but they cannot you know, um, get this treatment they need because, of, um, because you know, patent was uh, one of the big issues um, so this came out of an editorial that was written by Paul Farmer in um, the uh, Bulletin of the World Health Organization in 2003, raising these questions, these ethical questions about, you know, um, the the, um, the right to life. Um, so we do know that TRIPS uh, made some exceptions. Um, the so-called flexibilities on the, in the TRIPS agreement are guaranteeing uh, parallel imports and compulsory licenses. Now this is where the work of, um, for instance, the Clinton, Clinton Foundation uh, comes into, into, um, into, um, um, into um, um, focus. Um, the the parallel imports means that if a, patent, if a product is patented and is, uh, you know, the price is quite you know, exorbitant, you can actually search for you know, um, um, the global market. Anywhere you see the same product that is, that is cheaper, you can actually import from there. So that's why it's parallel, you know, it's uh, parallel. You can import from markets that are um, uh, less expensive, you know, than your own domestic markets. Compulsory licensing deals with situation where you have emergency in your country and you can actually uh, license local manufacturers to produce generics, you know, of uh, these uh, medicines. So, um, um, so these are the two major exceptions, flexibilities in TRIPS, in the TRIPS agreement. But um, um, in practice, you find that to take advantage of these flexibilities is not very easy. Uh, this is uh, an example that we, everybody knows about this, you know, that has started this problem. In 1998, when uh, 48 pharmaceutical companies uh, brought uh, the South African uh, uh, government to court, arguing that you know, what the government wanted to do in terms of creating, using these flexibilities was a, was a violation of the TRIPS agreement. This actually set a very bad precedent because this is the first time we are seeing, you know, transnational corporations uh, take a sovereign government to court in a domestic uh, court and basically saying that that government has violated an international uh, agreement. Um, the other example is the example from Brazil. When Brazil was trying to accept the TRIPS agreement, um, the, uh, what Brazil did was to say, we are not going to accept uh, um, uh, grant patents on any product if the workings of that product was not done in Brazil. So you can't, you, can't, you can't produce something in the U.S. or in Europe and come to Brazil and say we need a patent. You know? um, so they required, the Brazilian regulatory uh, uh, procedure required part of that, uh, that product, uh, the workings of that product to be done in Brazil. So these are, um, uh, um, in both of these two cases, the... Um, the, the U.S. was actually, because most of the pharmaceutical companies involved were, uh, you know, U.S. and European uh, companies. So um, these companies put a lot of uh, pressure on, uh, on the United States to take South Africa and Brazil to the WTO, you know, for um, arguing that, you know, what uh, they were doing was a violation of the TRIPS agreement. So this was the situation, the, 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 the position until 2001 when the WTO, under so much pressure, had to uh, adopt the so-called the Doha Declaration on trips and public health, where they affirmed that the trips agreement does not uh, preclude the country from pursuing uh, measures that actually are within the right to health. Um, and they went ahead in 2003 to add also that, um, um, uh, you know, that a country can implement um, uh, paragraph 6 of the declaration by, you know, licensing uh, domestic national uh, factories for producing uh, um, 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 generic versions of those drugs. But this, uh, this might look as a progress, but in, in practice, really, most of, the, uh, most of the developing countries, most of the African countries never had any capacity to, to produce these this, um, 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 generic versions of these uh, RVs domestically. So it's, about, it's just like giving some, somebody with um, something with um, uh, the right hand when you know that, uh, you know, basically he, can't, he or she cannot uh, take advantage of that. 
So um, if you give a pair of shoes to somebody who's, um, um, who is physically disabled, who doesn't have uh, you know, legs to wear those shoes, it's as good as you know, not having given him anything. Um, but some progress was made. Uh, Canada was the only country that uh, took advantage of those uh, 2003 decisions by um, um, agreeing to um, approach uh, countries. There was a, an, a company in Canada that was called Apotex. It was a generic uh, company. It approached a company that had um, a patents over three products, um, uh, three um, 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 uh, antiretroviral drugs, uh, SDT, 3TC, and Everapine. You combine this into a single, single tablet. And um, when they did this, it, was, it involved the protracted negotiations with the patent holder. And the Rwanda became the first and the only country that uh, initiated the procedure to use the WTO rules to allow um, this, uh, the importation of these drugs into, into Rwanda from Canada. You know, so it was, the negotiation was done in Canada um, and followed, following um, a request by the government of Rwanda, it was, tra they, it was transported. But after this, the vice president of Apotex said they're not going to do that anymore you know, because of the very complex administrative procedure involved in negotiating with the patent holder. So you could see, you know, um, the, the, the impediments, you know, to these uh, trips uh, flexibilities. Um, so in the case of, uh, you know, um, because no other country, you know, uh, was able to do this except Canada, and they did it only once and said they were not going to do it again because of the complexities, um, you find that there was a lot of um, um, interesting, uh, you know, discussions and alliances, you know, uh, within the South, the countries of the South. And one of those success stories was when, um, uh, uh, an Indian generic producer, Sipla, um, negotiated with the government of Rwanda to, to site a factory in Rwanda to produce generics of those medicines in Rwanda for purposes of the, the domestic markets. And at the time they did this, this actually pushed the, um, the access to uh, ARVs in Rwanda up and then, you know, based on uh, lower prices. There are so many countries that wanted to do this, to take that uh, initial, that, um, um, that, that, that same step, uh, Ghana, Tanzania, Ethiopia, um, but progress hasn't been made, you know, um, to, to cite those as examples. So there are impediments, you know, to all of these uh, TRIPS agreements, whether it's, you know, compulsory licensing, whether it's um, the South-South, you know, cooperative framework like the, the India CPL example with Uganda. And what is the major impediment to this is the, um, the corporate pressure that, you know, um, so many companies put on, you know, on uh, governments not to pursue those, uh, those flexibilities. Um, trade agreements are subject to this kind of, you know, um, uh, of these kinds of pressures from, from uh, uh, TNCs, transnational corporations. Um, so in terms of the way forward, uh, we need to, as Danny Roderick, the, uh, the famous uh, Harvard uh, professor, argued that um, WTO, um, the you know, economic globalization uh, that is led by, of which WTO is part of, and uh, constrains the capacity of, of nation states, the weaker states, to, to finance uh, social safety needs. So we need to actually look at um, how the policy space for agreements like the TRIPS, you know, uh, this kind of intellectual property agreements, need to address to, uh, to um, address some of the needs of the country, the, the less developed countries. All of these things about market access and national treatment and MFM principles uh, do not work in an asymmetric uh, uh, trading system. Um, the BRICS countries, you know, uh, yesterday they, you know, we saw a meeting in South Africa of the, the five countries. Russia, Brazil, India, China meeting. Um, they're supposed to provide leadership on all of this, uh, but we do know that each of these countries um, has, um, you know, their own internal, uh, you know, issues. So, for instance, you know, um, some, uh, uh, um, you know, some scholars have argued that um, a country like Brazil, for instance, for now, has its own internal, um, you know, internal uh, issues to deal with. So aligning its foreign policy with the broader South-South cooperative framework may not be the, the leading, um, may not be the main uh, foreign policy agenda. The same thing goes for China, for India. Um, but the most important thing is that if actually they can actually pull their resources together, their strong, you know, um, um, their strong um, bargaining power, they can actually counterbalance in a lot of ways uh, the uh, the uh, the weight of you know the U.S. and the European uh, um, uh, countries. So um, we need to um, look at you know uh, some of these issues in the context of uh, the emerging and re-emerging uh, foreign policy needs of these 
um, um, more progressive countries in the south. You know, the, the example is the five, the five uh, BRIC countries that are supposed to provide the leadership. You know, in um, uh, looking at these uh, uh, exceptions in a, in, a, in a trips, the flexibilities. You know, to find the best ways to to use the, those flexibilities to um, to the advantage of their countries in terms of providing a, more access to. Um, people suffering from uh, living with uh, with the HIV or AIDS. Thank you very much, and um, I look forward to uh, interacting with you um, on some of these issues. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, next presentation will be done by Paul Clyden from HIVI based, uh, which is uh, the uh, HIV treatment activist organization based in Lon London. Thank you very much, and um, thank you to everybody that stayed um, to, to come to our, our, prison, our session this, today. Um, and I'm only going to show you one slide because I want, it to, I want you to go away from this conference under absolutely no illusions about um, people with HIV speaking up, demanding what they want, and um, I, I'd like to ask if there's anybody in the audience that hasn't heard of a drug called dolotegravir. Please put your hand up. And hasn't noticed that um, women with HIV would like to have this drug, despite various unfortunate um, messages that have come across uh, since there was a safety signal with this drug, which suggests that it may be um, there are potential risks in using it at conception. We would like to make sure that people know that we demand that women are able to access this drug and instead of having a sort of blanket ban on what is potentially an enormous number of people living with HIV um, who are not pregnant. So if we, if we think about ART, if they're kind of figures are approximately one million women conceive on ART every year. That's an enormous amount of people that don't um, who could be missing out on this new treatment. So I'm not going to say very much about the history of AIDS activism and how people have always spoken up because I think everybody in the audience knows all about that. But I would like to just take this opportunity, if there's anybody left, at this conference, under any illusion that people aren't interested in having this drug if they're female, please take this message home with you. And um, contraception, contraception, contraception. And that's the end of my talk because I think there's a very distinguished speaker um, in the main auditorium coming, so we've been asked to slightly abbreviate what we were going to say, so we have a, a few moments for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Polly, and, and thank you to the speakers who have really laid out, um, I think, well, the title of the, um, I didn't hear the incentive part, but we've heard a lot of the reality of translating new therapy um, rapidly into action. Um, I just want to, Polly, thank you for bringing up the, the interventions that were done during this conference, because I think um, prior to the conference, it was a very... Uh, on DTG, it was a very scientific, statistical discussion. And I think what has been so extraordinary about the HIV field is it then became here a very human, human access, human rights discussion. And I think that's what separates us from many other fields is that dialogue and willingness to look at it differently. I will just say that we always have to be careful because words matter. And when the alert went out, um, simultaneously, 
all the orders and prospective orders were changed to a Favern space regiment. So, you know, it doesn't often matter what the, the discussion is afterwards. There is an immediate reaction um, that results in now, I think, significant delays in everyone having access um, to this very promising um, medication. And it really, I'm glad we opened with Chai's work on advanced mar market commitments and the ability to move drugs quickly and the what was not really said in deep detail by Caroline is how much work was done to make sure that TLD compounds came in and were accessible um, immediately at current drug pricing for the most of the world. That's really incredible. And now we will have um, this delay why we stored out um, the deep statistics and the analyses. So I just, um, I really want to thank um, the women's groups have made very clear during this conference that, um, that they are capable of looking at the statistics, analyzing them for themselves, and deciding what's best for them. And I think that's really critically important. So we're going to open this up for questions and answers. We will have 13 minutes or so, um, or maybe 17, um, and get you out of here by 12.15 or so. Thank you. First question, microphone one. Uh, so Sheena McCormack from London. Can I have two questions? You can have two questions. Thank you. Um, so one question uh, is about the differential pricing for uh, treatment and, uh, and PrEP. Um, when you're using the same drug. Um, so you heard the story from, from Youssef. And in the models in the working group that we looked at, the um, economic models, it looked as if we'd have to have an 80% reduction in the price of drug when we used it for PrEP uh, compared to treatment. So I just wondered if there was any thinking in PEPFAR about that. That was one question. And my second question was thinking about the 20-year patent and whether there is a call and a time to go back and re-examine that as high-income countries are facing a, a much aging population and a much greater increase in drugs that will be needed for a longer time. Therefore, the kind of profits that might be made would be greater because of the volume. And is there, a, is there a rationale for looking at that and saying, should we bring it down from 20 years? I don't know how they made the 20-year decision in the first place, but... Those my Microphone two. <clears throat> yes. Good morning. My name is Maria Esfeld. I work at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in the Netherlands. Um, I wanted to thank the speakers. Um, sorry, I, I can't pronounce your name, but the doctor for, from Malaysia. Yes. I think it's very nice how you set out the trips, flexibilities, and how they have been used, and what difficulties you come across. And what struck me in your presentation is that it seems that it's like the South versus the Western world, um, and that the Western world has other um, uh, um, interests. And I really would like to thank also Dr. Azad for pointing out that even in Western countries, including my own country, we have issues with the pricing of drugs. And so it's really not, not a question, but more a suggestion. I really face in my own country that we have to have very strong discussions with our colleagues who work in the trade department. And it seems that we as health officials sometimes think, oh, it's too complicated. Just let our colleagues from the Trade Department deal with it. It's just a public call, basically, not to do that and to keep on fighting, because I see that, indeed, things can be changed. And in our country, we have, indeed, asked the European Commission to reevaluate these uh, SPCs, for instance, and the report has just been published, just to see what the added value is for public health uh, reasons. And I think you know, even there might be big, uh, a lot of big pharma in the Western world that shouldn't uh, keep us as health workers from uh, engaging in the discussion. Back to microphone one. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to, I just had a comment more than a question, but just wanted to let uh, uh, Dr. Aginam know um, that since your talk focused so much on patents, just wanted to know if you're aware of medicine's patent pool, uh, because we um, have licenses with nine patent holders, and it's because of this particular license that we signed with Viv in 2014 that today companies like Cipla, Hetero, have got approvals for Dolita Gravir through our license. And 
of course, with Myelin for TLD. So we are one of the primary organizations who kind of drove this message of you know, providing access to middle-income countries. And we now have more than 92 countries covered in WIV agreement, and most of the African countries are covered by that. Of course, we don't control the pricing, but uh, our vision is to promote access to uh, these medicines for HIV, TB, and hepatitis through our voluntary licenses. So just wanted to let you know about that. Great. I'm going to turn to the panel to start answering the questions. We've all um, declared that we don't very, know very much about IP um, at this end of the day, although I think that Yusuf is being a little uh, modest. So I'm going to pass that on to the other panelists, please. Okay, um, I think the, I think some of the panel, some of the questions were directly addressed to me. Um, let me start with the last yes. one, which is the comments. Uh, I know about the uh, the um, the medicine uh, patents pool, so thank you very much for bringing it up, and that's actually an um, um, an incredible example of how things could be done, you know, to advance. The, the right to life and right to health <laughs> arguments. Um, but uh, let me address the uh, question from our colleagues from the uh, Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, which is really um, what this is all about. Um, we've, been, we've been, in my institute, we've been asking the same questions. You know, how can we uh, get the, the trade and health ministries to talk together, to talk to, to one another? You know, um, WHO has had series of resolutions on policy coherence, you know, for, for health and trade. But what we see in various countries, um, it doesn't matter whether it's developed or developing country, um, is the fact that the health ministry is always, you know, um, doesn't, is not as powerful as the, the finance and the trade ministries. And when often you uh, try to build capacity in developing countries, for instance, um, um, by trying to work with the health ministries about the implications of these kinds of agreements. Um, the, the response we get is, this is a trade issue, you know, it's not a health issue. And if you don't address it as a health issue, um, 10, 15 years down the line, you start grappling with the health impacts of, you know, these agreements. So, so the way to go is to, to build a policy coherence framework between uh, not just uh, health and uh, and finance and trade ministries, but all the stakeholders that are you know that are, um, that have interest in all of this. Um, things cannot be done in silos. You know, it, it, the example we give, we normally give. Just last week, we we were part of a meeting at the uh, Asia Development Bank in Manila, uh, ADB in Philippines, and this was actually what we we're talking about. You know, we led a, a discussion there on policy coherence, looking at the least developed countries in Southeast Asia, Cambodia, Laos. You know, these are all members of the WTO, and they are grappling with these questions. And if you, you can imagine if these were serious issues for industrialized countries, you can imagine what, you know, in the context of these uh, least developed countries, um, you know, what they are dealing with. So, uh, and there were very senior health officials in the room, and they openly, you know, told us, you know, what can we do? How can, we, how can you help us to build capacity, you know, to, to address this uh, policy incoherence? between uh, trade and health, you know, looking at intellectual property trips, for instance. Um, one of the things that came out of that meeting um, is the fact that um, um, when you, um, at the uh, initial, when uh, the WTO agreements were being negotiated, um, there was absolutely no consultation at all, you know, with the health counterparts. And um, these things were signed and negotiated and ratified by governments. And in a couple of years down the line, uh, we now started dealing with, you know, the health impacts of, you know, patents, for instance, and, um, you know, how this is actually constraining um, uh, the policy space for countries to make decisions, you know. Um, and we're talking about something that happened in 1995 until today, you know, it still has a huge impact on access. Um, so I agree with you, and thank you for pointing that uh, out. The other point I want to make also is that, uh, based on your comments, is that um, um, if you look at the various, you know, the global constituency for this, um, we are not actually, it's not actually a South versus North uh, or, you know, developing country versus Western countries uh, kind of argument. I mean, there are very good people uh, uh, in terms of, you know, whether they are researchers or civil society groups in the West who actually have been very vocal, you know, against what has happened in terms of how TRIPS has trumped the right to health, how, you know, IP, you know, has trumped the right to health. So within these countries and also within the developing countries or, you know, middle income economies, you also see people who are pro-patent. You know, so 
Um, I don't think it's that simplistic to say, you know, it's a developing country versus the West. But the reason why we, why we, we, we um, um, you know, we, um, we talk about it this way is the fact that, you know, the, um, 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 the activism surrounding the, that led to the, um, you know, the Doha Declaration and all of this were led by, you know, uh, the countries of the South, you know, who basically were uh, arguing that the uh, international system under which uh, these uh, trade agreements were negotiated have been very um, unfair, you know, to, uh, to their interests. So thank you very much. I think this is an area that needs a lot of work, you know, um, uh, trade policy coherence. Yeah, for the, the couple of questions directed to PEPFAR, I think we've been very privileged um, since about 2005 to have um, a really extraordinary situation where we are um, have a FDA process that allows us to bring generics to um, PEPFAR very quickly. Um, we've been impressed over the last couple of years as the movement from innovative development and in the innovators to the generic com to companies and transfer of licensures within our field in a very rapid way, um, and sometimes even before FDA approval. And I think that's been quietly and often not applauded, but it's been really important to us to really get these products available quickly. I also look at the TB field where we've had um, a, a really critical TB drug off of, it's been off of, um, it's been way past 20 years of its patent, um, and no generic companies have picked it up and made it um, and gotten it out there. So there's the other side of this, and this is us clearly articulating the demand, and I guess, uh, although we can't do advanced market commitments, I think what Chai feeling that field and allowing that to move forward, because sometimes they have to change whole manufacturing lines um, to be able to do this. But I am very disappointed that we have TB drugs available that are important for preventive therapy and off patent, and we haven't taken them into generic. So I think it's a complicated issue, um, but I think I love the way it was raised that we have to learn to make our business case better to ministers of finance and ministers of trade. Um, we're very good at speaking with each other, and we understand our health issues in a staccato, acronym-driven way, um, but not everyone else does, and sometimes they, their eyes glaze over when I talk to ministers of finance, and I've learned that anything I want to say, I have to say in the first 30 seconds. Otherwise, I can't, it's hard to make the, the point relative to roads and telecom about how important um, your work is. So um, I, I think there's three sides to this issue. One of them is uptake and use, and we certainly are working to expand PrEP and PrEP access in all of our PEPFAR countries. Um, in the first two quarters of 18, um, we have about 30,000 um, new individuals on PrEP. Um, at the PEPFAR light speed will probably be the largest PEP, PrEP provider in just a matter of months. But that often is not a good thing because it means the countries themselves may not be really invested in this prevention approach. And I really appreciate you raising the issue that there is lack of maybe critical understanding between the prevention modalities and their impact and treatment modalities and their impact. And I think we're gonna, this is gonna become more and more complicated and I really applaud the question from the UK because we're already, how do we make the point of U equals U, which we think is critical um, for both the health of the individual and for a transmission and say we can get to U equals U and that's really critical and over here we're saying we need PrEP and we need PrEP to be able to protect others. So it's. It's getting more and more complicated because people are asking me, why don't you just ensure that everybody's virally suppressed? Um, and because that helps two things. It ensures the individual person's health um, so that they don't progress at all in disease. It decreases their risk of TB. It be, it's really terrific for them. And it also has the secondary consequence of creating a non-transmissible space. And then they say, you want to still use PrEP, so explain it to me. Sometimes our models don't integrate the two pieces of the model. And I know if we were better at putting all of the pieces together in a way and by age band. And I really encourage all of our model, modelers to continue to go back and look at our 
our risk group and our impact, and our impact both at the individuals, of course, DALYs, but also the cost-benefit ratios, I think we can get to an extraordinary space. But thank you for raising in the end, um, this conference is about access and ensuring that we take in the, the consideration of what people want or willing to take rather than us making decisions for others. And I think that's been our strength of our field. Let's not use, lose that strength and let's celebrate that strength even if it's difficult um, in the moment because I think that's what makes us real and passionate and compassionate about the work that we do. So we have this critical lecture in Hall 12. I, are there any last comments from the audience? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much for the presentations. My name is Andrew Oswa from Uganda. And uh, my comment and uh, question, I think, will go to Polly. Uh, we have had a very good call uh, about the involvement of women and basically giving them a right to choose when it comes to DTG regimens. But on the other side, I think we have or we're going to face a real uh, legal risk, okay, when it comes to the quality of the process that, you know, countries are going to be following to initiate ladies on this, uh, uh, on this uh, regimen. And on that note, I'm really thinking that we might also need another movement that is going to work around protecting the various parties that are going to be involved in the supply chain, but also in the programs, when we come up with one or two issues, okay, that can really be tagged to a problem around the regimen. I think in our countries where the systems are not that good, there are some uh, parties that will just be waiting for the first opportunity to take on program people or people along the supply chain and raise issues around how these ladies or patients, you know, were initiated on these uh, regimens and if, you know, care was taken, okay, to make sure that a problem uh, could have been avoided. Thank you. Great. Let's take the last question and we'll have a quick response. Thank you. My name is Eva from Botswana and I'm on the board of ITPC, which is an activist, global activist um, organization that has done a lot of work with IP. And I think one of the things one of the things that we should also maybe consider, I'd like to hear from our colleague from the UN, is about the World Bank's categorization of, of countries to begin with. It kind of sets this arbitrary um, system that prevents poor people, even in the United States or in other countries, from actually benefiting. And, and has put this kind of very complicated system on top of it, and what can be done to actually challenge some of that. Thank you. Great. Quick responses from our two colleagues on the panel. Um, I think I was asked about how, how we protect the people that work in sort of procurement and the, and the supply chain. Um, and I'm not, I'm not terribly clear about the question, but... I think the most important thing, and I hope this is, is actually communicating, communicating, working with communities, working with activists, making sure that people, everybody's on the same page, they understand the process. Hopefully, when we've done all the kind of geeky statistical, because I'm a very geeky activist, um, which is why I wanted to have a picture of somebody actually demanding treatment for themselves. But I think, I think you really need to talk to communities make sure everybody understands the risks and the, and the benefits. I think since we've had this signal, we've forgotten the reason. I mean, I'm on all sorts of treatment optimization kind of panels and programs and this and that and meetings. We all decided dolotegravir was the best drug. And then we've suddenly forgotten all that and we're just focusing on this one small issue. So I think, I think communication and making sure that you always involve communities in these decisions, I think, to take away the autonomy, you know, I'm, going, I'm getting out old sort of feminist posters about bodily autonomy. Women really need to be part of that decision. They're gonna spend a lot of their lives not being pregnant and, and your, the health system can help them if they don't want to have a child, not to have one. 
we have the technology. We just have to figure out how it's all going to work. And I, I can sit here on a panel and say that, and I'm afraid you, you've got to go and do it. So I, I, I say this with great respect to everybody's work, because I know it's a huge amount of work. And our colleague from the UN. Yes. Um, I mean, that's a very difficult question to answer. And uh, that's why, you know, I was talking about the, um, the asymmetrical uh, system in which these uh, trade agreements are negotiated. Um, you know, uh, the World Bank um, is always the big elephant in the room, you know, in terms of um, the enormous influence uh, it has on countries uh, because of its, uh, you know, economic uh, power. Um, on the other side, look at the UN agencies, you know, and the, the, the promote, you know, um, human rights and um, some of the soft, um, um, non-binding approaches. So when you put the two on a scale, obviously the countries listen to the World Bank because they have the money and they have the, you know, the economic influence. But having said that, um, um, that's, you know, some of the slides I showed about, you know, what, uh, you know, the South-South coalitions can achieve, you know, if they actually get the, the act together. Uh, they can actually counterbalance some of those influence, and it's beginning to happen. You know, the BRIC countries have put together what they call the BRIC uh, Development Bank or something like that. You know, uh, capitalized with uh, billions of dollars. You know, to be able to do this kind of work in in, in developing countries. Um, and, but you know, the mechanics of that is going to um, be worked out in the in the years ahead. The World Bank will still live with us. It's not going to go away. But uh, the most important thing is how to think about. Um, in a very smart way, you know, to, um, 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 to um, think about how uh, uh, alternative programs could actually lessen, you know, the, the, um, some of the, the, the bureaucratic uh, uh, architecture that, you know, uh, that exists in these countries. So uh, I agree with you, you know, um, uh, but, you know, we need to be a bit more innovative about how to uh, um, um, make the international system, you know, fairer. Great. Um, I just want to thank my fabulous co-chair who stood in from Kazakhstan very quickly. Um, the really thought-provoking presentations, and I know some of you also were called to action just recently, and the presentations were superb, and the insightful questions, which I think really illustrate our work to be done. So thank you. Um, please go to Hall 12 um, and enjoy our special honored guest. <laughs>